if one person says yes, yes. we can move forward. Yes. Awesome. Excellent. All right. Um, so thank you all for attending the third ever trail talk um, uh, on transit to trails. Um, we have four speakers that are going to be joining us today, uh, including Ryan Bransafort, the co-founder and CEO of Outer Spatial, Tina Hug, a senior planner for the Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District, or MidPen, Christy Wegner, Director of Planning at SamTrans, and Robert Betts, Director of Operations and Planning at Marin Transit. Um, Ryan Bransaford is going to be the facilitator today, and we'll get us uh, started in just a couple minutes. But I just wanted to go through a little bit um, of the history of Trail Talks and why we're doing it, and the Bay Area Trails Collaborative, and who we are as a coalition. So welcome everyone. Um, we are uh, the Bay Area Trails Collaborative. We're a group of organizations, agencies, and nonprofits that are working uh, to actualize a 2,600 plus mile regional trail network throughout the Bay Area. Um, trail Talks came out of uh, BATC or the Bay Area Trails Collaborative strategic plan uh, in 2020. Um, where we were tasked to share and promote regional trail network best practices. Um, and then we had a meeting discussion in January of 2021, uh, talking about how we can provide a forum for deeper dives into trending topics and compelling issues affecting trail development in the Bay Area and trail talks were then born. Uh, so we uh, voted on a name in April 2021, which is why we are calling these uh, webinars Trail Talks. Um, and we came up with five topics, uh, the third being transit to trails, which is what we were discussing today. Um, and we have uh, a lot of great folks that signed up to volunteer their time um, to uh, speak on these topics. Um, and today we have a bunch of folks from MidPen, um, including Tina, who will be speaking today, um, Ryan, um, and then Ryan and Tina recruited uh, some uh, great speakers from uh, some transit agencies around the Bay. Um, and we're excited uh, for everyone to be joining us today um, to listen and learn from their experiences. Um, the next trail talk is going to be on user conflicts on trails um, in August or September. We'll keep you posted on that. Um, and then we'll be discussing equitable access to trails after that. And there's a little bit more of a TBD on that topic. So if you'd like to get involved, we're actually discussing trail talks at our upcoming Batsy meeting, which is next Tuesday uh, on the 26th at 10 a.m. Um, so we're excited for folks on this uh, webinar to join that discussion. But if you're unable to make it, feel free to email me at benk at railstotrails.org with any uh, trail talks topics that you'd like to see included in the future or to volunteer yourself uh, to be involved in an upcoming trail top talk topic, which is a tongue twister. Um, and then finally, if you are not already involved in the Bay Area Trails Collaborative and would like to be, um, please check us out at www.railstotrails.org slash Batsy. Um, and if you'd like to sign up as a member or a friend, uh, add that hashtag get involved uh, after there. Uh, and it'll get you down to the page where you can uh, join as a member or friend. Um, it's free and it just is a, uh, you know, you're stating your intention of uh, getting behind our vision and being involved in our work. So thank you so much. Without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and pass the baton over to Ryan Bransafort. Good afternoon, everybody. It's good to see some familiar faces. Um, thanks, Ben. And while I'm loading this up, I would encourage anyone who's not involved with Batsy to get involved. Wonderful organization. I've been involved for, gosh, since the beginning. It's maybe been a decade or so now. So really exciting organization. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining on a Tuesday afternoon in midsummer. I just want to give a quick introduction to myself. I think I know a lot of you folks on the call, which is great. But in the context of, of the topic for today, I'm a huge advocate, as some of you know, around getting people outside and ideally without a car. Uh, so using public transportation, bikes and so forth. Um, my credentials in that aspect, are, in that realm are uh, many years of car-free living, 
you know, the little kids now certainly have a car um, to get them around a little bit more, but mostly on bike. Um, but yeah, I started Transcend Trails, which um, has transitioned now, but we ran that for about 10 years. And it's a web and mobile app focused on getting people outside without a car. Uh, I initiated the alt ride, which we rode up Mount Tam, Mount Diablo, and Mount Hamilton in the same day without a car using Caltrain, the ferry, and, and BART. Uh, and now I run Outer Spatial, which is, as many of you know, focused on empowering land management organizations and other types of groups to connect people to the outdoors through mobile, mobile and web. So it's a little bit about my background. Um, you know, part of what I wanted to do and what we want to do to get, get things started was sort of frame this idea of, of transit to trails. And I pulled an old logo that we had from the, the old transit trails day. We had that website going. Um, but, you know, when we sat down and, and Tina and folks at MidPen and and, and Ben and I and Joshua and others you know, started talking about transit to trails. There's just so many different topics and we literally could spend a full day or more on a number of these different sort of aspects of transit to trails. And I wanted to kind of touch on a few in the next few minutes. So we talked about equity, you know, DII or DEI um, and how transportation is such a huge barrier for lots of people, especially people sort of disproportionately impacting people of color and low in low underserved communities, um, the way transportation impacts climate and the environment, uh, the mental and, and physical health aspects of connecting to the outdoors and being outside with park prescriptions and so forth. Technology is kind of woven in throughout, you know, all of this. I think we'll touch on that a little bit throughout today's talk. Uh, the legislative side, Josh has a lot of, you know, interesting insight on, on that aspect from MidPen, but there's been some recent bills and acts that have been passed that do provide funding, um, public education, marketing outreach, uh, just letting people know about opportunities, know about transportation and ways that people can get out to parks is another big element that we didn't really have time to focus on today. Uh, what we will be focusing on, on is the transportation and sort of transit agency perspective, as well as the open space uh, land management organization perspective. Um, before we transition, uh, just a, a couple highlights, you know, DEI, DEI uh, there's a lot of groups doing some really interesting work around connecting people to the outdoors. There's obviously a lot more work to do. Um, Nature for All is an organization that's based out of LA that focuses on getting kids from the city out into some of the Forest Service lands and parks around LA County. So again, a full day topic, which you know we're certainly not going to even scratch the surface of today. We certainly wanted to address the impact on you know, uh, transit to trails has on, on um, the equity element. Climate change, um, you know, we know that transportation has a big impact on, you know, changing climate. Uh, I pulled this quote out of an article that came out recently out of the USA Streets blog, which I thought was pretty telling and sort of climate change environment. But, you know, essentially what it's saying is that, you know, the vast majority of national park sites really struggle with air pollution problems and things related to the environment largely caused by cars. And you know, a lot of these areas don't have a lot of local traffic. So essentially people are driving to parks and that's having an impact on the environment. And we know a lot of groups doing a lot of good work to try to change this, but it's a, it's a pretty significant uphill battle. This was a national park focused article and there's a lot of great work going on with NPS, but uh, it's more about it within parks as opposed to getting to parks. So something that we certainly want to, you know, continue to have at the forefront of our thoughts and minds. Uh, technology, um, you know, Uber, Lyft, these kind of like micro transportation opportunities, um, you know, mobile apps and things like that. Uh, transit routing being available on Google Maps. These, you know, in, in, in Yahoo Maps and, and other mapping applications is, is, is a huge part of getting people information to get outside. So this would be something I would love to spend a whole day talking about, but just we're not gonna have the time today, but we think technology is a huge, plays a huge role and it will kind of come up throughout. Legislation I mentioned, um, the Transit to Trails Act, which passed a couple of years ago, this is providing some funding for um, getting your folks, you know, using public transit out at the parks. Um, you know, the last one is, is, is really, uh, well, sorry, this is the last couple of slides I'll show before I hand it off. There is some exciting work happening, and, and of course, we're not going to go into all of it today, but I just want to highlight a couple of things that I thought were really interesting. Um, this, this one here is a local meetup group that has over 7,000 members, so 
you know, people sort of organizing on their own to guide trips, you know, to get outside and use local public transportation. I think that there, that could be a huge role in impacting opportunities for people and getting people, you know, uh, that are uncomfortable with getting on transit and getting out of their cars or just getting out into parks, you know, leveraging people that do it and have that experience. Um, the car-free uh, Mount Hood, I was actually up just traveling through the Portland area and I've been pretty familiar with this project, but they're doing a lot of great work in that area to get people from Portland up to Mount Hood and some really good marketing materials. Um, Trailhead Direct, which is a bus that's dedicated to getting people from Seattle up to some of the great parks in the Seattle metro area. Uh, some really cool work going on up there and that's been going on for a number of years Sort of relationship between the park agencies as well as the, um, the transit agencies. And then uh, lastly, you know, within the park service, there's a lot of national parks that are starting to remove cars. So kind of that within park experience is improving. Zion uh, does not allow cars. It's just one example for really great transportation system. But as I alluded to before, a lot of the challenges are getting people to the park and not necessarily within the park. Um, so yeah, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and transition to our agenda for today. Um, we're, we're gonna, I'm gonna pass it over to Tina from MidPen, who's gonna talk about the agency, the Open Space District's perspective. And then after Tina, we'll have Christy from SamTrans and then Robert from Marin Transit. And then at the end, we'll kind of focus on some key takeaways and then some Q and A. So with that, I'm gonna stop my screen and pass it over to Tina. Tina, take it away. Thanks, Ryan. I'm gonna share my screen now. Sure, I shared the wrong one. Okay. Well, thanks very much for having us uh, this afternoon. We're um, happy to be here and um, happy to be joined by Christian Robert to sort of uh, round out this conversation of transit to trails. Um, as uh, you know, I'm joined by another uh, set of MidPen folks, Jane Mark, Josh Hug, and Tyler Smith, who've all participated in, in developing this talk with me. Uh, just a little bit about MidPen. I think I'm speaking to folks who already know us, but just in case, we do have a threefold mission to preserve open space, protect the natural environment, and provide ecologically sensitive recreation. And we have a coastal mission as well, which is related to preserving agriculture and the rural character in those areas. So that's MidPen's mission. And we are governed by uh, an elected board of directors and we are um, fairly large. We span three counties, portions of three counties serve 770,000 constituents. We have 26 uh, preserves and um, they are open free to the public uh, seven days a week. We um, do range from uh, up near San Carlos down to Los Gatos towards, um, towards the south. Uh, we go side to side, east to west from the coast to the bay. And um, I wanna point out in dark green, these are our 26 preserves that uh, sprawl along the ridge line. Um, and if you consider those preserves, we also, serve the dots. The dots represent 100 people. And so you can see the cluster of um, population is right along the bay and kind of uh, scattered throughout the rest of the, the area that we, um, our jurisdiction um, lies over. And I think this is a pretty telling picture of the challenge it is for us to provide transit to open space. Uh, there's a big gap um, it, right in the middle, the Santa Cruz Mountain Ridge Line. Our underserved communities have um, routinely indicated that transportation is a big barrier to access to our open space. And, and this, this picture really tells that story. And this is the second picture that uh, tells that story as well, because our preserves, although uh, we're very locally focused, we actually have a, draw, a big draw. Um, this is a project that we're doing here in the middle. It's called Persman Creek Redwoods. And we did a, a visitor analysis and saw from license plate data that we saw have folks coming from as far out as Stanislaus, Stanislaus and San Joaquin counties and all throughout the Bay Area well without outside our jurisdiction. So again, we we're seeing a lot of visitation from folks um, way, way outside our boundary. 
And uh, another complexity to layer on top of that is uh, the disadvantaged communities um, that are, again, uh, far from open space. Uh, it definitely uh, raises the question of equity and access. You can see the preserves all running down here, down the spine, and they are all clustered in, in areas that are uh, typically really far uh, from transit. So as um, as was mentioned before, this is going to be a, a topic for another talk, and I'm sure it's going to be extremely interesting to talk about those challenges. This is our case study, the one I showed you in the pre previous map. Uh, this is Parisma Creek Open Space Preserve, and we are trying to improve access to it. It sees about 200,000 visitors a year. Um, it's about 5,400 acres in size. It's actually only this section right now, the section that's closest to the coast is not yet open. So 200,000 people visit this little section here. Um, so it's popular, very popular, and it is um, accessible through um, the highway system. And and being really far from the transit lines and urban centers, people generally take their cars there. And it has become uh, an increasing problem. I think um, all park agencies are experiencing that. Um, COVID really underscored that. And so without any alternative modes of transportation, people use their cars. And um, it, does, uh, it does highlight a, a, you know, another pressing issue, which is ask, accessing open space like this is almost always um, a high VMT proposition. For this preserve, we did conduct visitor surveys to find out what challenges people have. And of course, the answer is parking. Um, and we do note that the demand is the highest on weekends for most of our entrances. And occasionally, some entrances are so popular they get full on the weekdays as well. So the struggle to find parking and struggle to how to access to the preserve is, is really a big deal for us. And um, we noted in our visitor surveys that a, some folks have you know, focused on public transportation, the fact that it's not available or it's limited or it just takes too long. So these are some of the barriers that we've um, encountered and it's probably nothing new for a lot of folks, but for us, this is rather new because this hasn't been our focus. This isn't our, um, this isn't our bread and butter. So uh, one of the things we've, we've, we immediately battle is the, the car, um, the convenience of the car, um, how, how to get people out of their cars, disincentivizing it. Um, and, you know, we, we ask you, if you have any ideas, please drop them in the chat uh, of how to do that. Uh, we know people like shorter wait times. They like shorter trips. Um, we also know that we are not necessarily a destination site like Mere Woods. Uh, we, we serve, we have a, a purpose, we serve um, a purpose, but it's not a destination like some of our um, more spectacular parks. Um, we also struggle with funding the resources, again, because this is our, our wheelhouse, sort of knowing how to tackle this problem that isn't one that we're really familiar with. And uh, human, human behavior, it's another thing that we've, um, we've realized is that just because people say they support this shuttle doesn't necessarily mean they're going to take the shuttle. Um, it's, it's a matter of, it's a great idea, but would you actually use it? Um, maybe not, not if you're going to the beach and you have all your gear with you and your family, it, it poses a, an issue. So for us, um, the first and last mile is, is more like a first and last miles issue. We, we have a lot of miles in between us and then the nearest transit um, hub and our preserves are all different. Um, as you saw from our, our map, our, we span a huge area. We have visitors from all over there, uh, all over. We don't really have great origin or destination focus points. So it's, it's very dispersed and we have a lot of players. We've got a lot of communities. We have a lot of transit agencies. Uh, we've uh, 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 many, many cities and counties. And the small but um, large issue for us is that in some places we don't have cell service. So something that's on demand isn't really feasible at this point in time and you can get there, but you won't be able to call anyone to get you back. So that, that poses a bit of an issue for us as well. Uh, but we're hopeful. Um, 
although we don't have any solutions uh, and, and, and you know, we know that this is going to take a unique set of circumstances to actually be successful. Um, we're hopeful. Uh, we know we're going to need help. Uh, we're going to need some subject matter experts. A couple of them are on the call. Um, we're already in talks about what ideas we might have. Uh, we know we're going to get our parking lots ready. Uh, if we do ever have a shuttle or a, a transit uh, option out there, we want to have our parking lots ready uh, to receive those, um, those opportunities. Um, again, we're starting to deal with uh, human behavior. How do we make uh, parking less convenient? Do we know um, Do we know if opportunities where we have to limit access to a preserve or a particular parking area to drive people to a shuttle? We're starting to explore that. We're also starting to explore whether we need to do reservations or maybe priority, um, priority parking for those who uh, do carpool or other, other types of specialized parking needs. So we're, we know we're right at the start of uh, figuring this out. Um, we do have our Prisma Creek Redwoods Preserve to try it out on. Uh, we just know that whatever we try, it's gonna be something that we're gonna pilot and we're gonna have to adapt. And uh, it's gonna be a journey and uh, we're looking forward to taking it and hopefully with some of our partners. And here's who's on the call for us in Midpen, and I will turn my time over to Christy. Thanks, Tina. Can you hear me okay? Great. Uh, thank you so much, um, everyone. My name is Tina, or my name is not Tina. My name is Christy Wagner. I am the Director of Planning uh, at SAM Trans, and I'm happy to be here today. Just want to uh, make sure, or, or I'm going to give you a little spoiler alert. I don't have the solution uh, for you right now, but I am um, happy to share that we are, Sam Trans is a committed partner in helping you to find the solution. Uh, let me go ahead and do a full screen here. Okay. So today my presentation um, will be brief. I want to give you an overview of our Sam Trans route network uh, to familiarize you with our routes and services and then spend some time talking about a comprehensive study that we just completed called Reimagine SAMTRANS and introduce you to our new bus network that we will be starting to unveil in a few short weeks. And then uh, spend a minute or two talking to you about innovation because the big bus is not always the right solution for all the transportation needs and problems. And so we recognize that in San Mateo County um, and we are uh, interested in innovating. And so we are um, bringing micro transit to our community here. And then last, I'll just conclude with some considerations uh, for you to think about as you're uh, looking at a pilot. So um, on the left is a, it's a map of our new route network. All of the routes, the uh, fixed routes are in blue. We have our future micro transit zones in pink. Um, I will talk about those a little later um, in the presentation. Um, but really what I want you to take away from this is we serve a large service area. We serve three counties. We go into San Francisco and um, Santa Clara County. We have diverse geography and topography. We are Bayside. We also have the coast side to serve. We have a variety of routes. We have local routes, community, express, school routes, and we also um, operate the paratransit service for folks who cannot access our fixed route system. Uh, this is the fourth transit agency I've worked for in my career, uh, and it's probably the most challenging, very car-centric out here, and, and with the, the geography and the diversity and the challenging land use patterns, it makes transit, especially the bus, pretty tricky. Um, which is why when I first started here, um, I helped to launch Reimagine Sam Trans, which is a soup to nuts look at the route network. Uh, can everybody mute? I'm getting some feedback here, I'm sorry. Um, okay, so we launched Reimagine Sam Trans in summer of 2019 and really took the first few months to do a deep dive into our data to understand the trip making behavior on our system, to understand the on-time performance, to understand bus stop utilization. We did a lot of public outreach in um, late 2019 to really just understand what people wanted from, a net, from our network, what they liked, what they didn't like. You know, I, I believe I engaged with MidPen either in our first or second round of outreach to talk about how to better serve parks with our new network. Uh, so we really uh, took some time to really understand what the wants were. Uh, we had to pause in uh, early 2020, obviously for the COVID, um, to support some 
uh, service planning uh, as it related to the, the pandemic. We restarted later in 2020, came up with three different route network alternatives, took that back out to the public to get feedback, uh, and then crafted our final network last summer. That was just approved by our board in March, and we are starting to implement August 7th. So uh, if you live in San Mateo County, you may start to see some signs um, with uh, information about our new network that will be here in a few weeks. But the, the point of this slide is we, um, I mean, our job is to balance competing needs. We have limited resources and we often you know, have requests for service. So this was a once in a decade level study to really kind of uh, start with a blank slate. What do, we, what do we need our network to look like? And our new network is uh, founded in four guiding principles. It is focusing on the customer and we are thinking about our customer when we are making decisions. Uh, we are thinking about our workforce. We have a, um, a historically low number of bus operators right now. And we actually don't have enough bus operators to run pre-pandemic levels of service. So it's really essential that we think about our workforce, um, quality of life and you know, human rights issues, access to restrooms, but also designing service that they can reasonably deliver. We wanna be effective and efficient with our resources. And really we want to advance the principles of social equity. That was so important to our project team when we started it, and it even became more important coming out of the pandemic um, we have identified equity priority communities in our county, looking at race, income, and car ownership. And um, I'm so proud to say that we have successfully, um, well, our new network has, it realigns unproductive service from um, wealthy areas and reallocates those services in our highest need communities. And it's, we're really bleeding edge with some of this. I'm very, very proud of that work. Um, and now we're in the, we're in the tough stage of actually having to peel away the bus service and, and, and you know, communicate that to the riders. But um, I'm very proud of that. And, it, and equity is, is, will remain very essential to us in our service design. Our new network um, brings more frequency to the county. Uh, we will have four routes running every 15 minutes, seven days a week. We definitely heard that people want more off-peak service. So midday, nights, and weekends. We are bringing new service to Oyster Point, which is an area of expansive growth. Um, also uh, bringing two new routes to two community college campuses. We are trying to be more direct with our service so we can be faster. Uh, we are trying to be more efficient with our resources and uh, you know, be easier to understand. So we are consolidating some of our um, most expensive and resource intensive routes, which are, are our school focused routes. And we are trying to be innovative, looking at micro transit zones um, in two communities. So I'll now um, just spend a minute talking about microtransit. Some of you may have heard this word before. It's microtransit's been around for maybe 10 years now, five to 10 years. Uh, back in 2019, we launched a microtransit pilot in Pacifica. And I, I uh, grabbed this slide from a former board presentation. Uh, from the internet in 2019, microtransit is a form of demand responsive transit. This technology enables transit service um, to offer more flexible routing and scheduling with smaller vehicles. And it conceptually fits somewhere between private cars and big, large buses. Um, and what is, uh, you know, what's nice about microtransit is it is flexible. It uses an app-based technology to route the vehicle in real time and dynamically pick up people who make requests. It does allow us to get into the nooks and crannies of communities that may be difficult to serve with big buses. Um, and as I mentioned, we had a, a pilot in Pacifica and then Linda Mar community for about a year um, in 2019 and 2020. And while that pilot was not successful, we ended up reverting back to this, the service that was operating before. We did learn a lot. Uh, and so as I just want to pause and say, as you're thinking about a pilot, don't be afraid to fail. Um, sometimes you can, in, through failure, you really learn what the right fit is and how you can bring something back in a better way. Uh, so that's what we're doing. We're bringing microtransit back in a better way. We're not running it like we used to in Pacifica. We are doing a full turnkey contract and uh, we just received proposals last week. So we'll be uh, evaluating those and hopefully making an award at the end of the year. Uh, but we have two zones that we are advancing and we like them for microtransit for different reasons. Um, for Half Moon Bay, uh, what I like is that there are irregular travel patterns and traffic patterns. They see a lot of weekend traffic, the seasonal traffic, low density. It's a challenging pedestrian environment. And we constantly get requests to serve the beaches. And the beaches are very hard to serve with big buses. And there isn't that pedestrian infrastructure on Highway 1 to safely stop a bus and alight passengers. So 
Um, I think Half Moon Bay will uh, be a great place for microtransit, so it can you know take people to sort of the nooks and crannies um, of the community where the the big bus cannot. And then we have East Palo Alto. We think that's another community. Uh, this is a historically disadvantaged community with a very challenging street network. Twenty five percent of the residents live in this little sliver of East Palo Alto. Um, there are a lot of local trips that are taken. And so we do think that this is another community that um, will benefit from, from microtransit. Um, and so just the, my last slide before I turn it over to Robert, um, just some things for you to think about uh, as you're thinking about Parisma Creek or you know, other pilot areas. Start small, you know, don't be too big. Uh, really try to understand the problem that you're trying to solve. And I think define success, you know, get, get buy-in on what success looks like. Try to find funding opportunities, you know, build those partnerships and support. Um, we're happy to provide technical assistance um, and, and that can look a variety of ways. Um, I know you're talking to your community. Uh, I, I don't think we would have been so successful with Reimagine had we not had such robust community involvement. Um, I really feel very strongly about that. And don't be afraid to fail. Um, I think that's important too. And I'll just say transit works where cars don't. Leave that, leave you with that. And um, I'm going to turn it over to um, my one of my favorite colleagues, Robert Betts, who works up in Marin County. And um, we often share information. Transit agencies like to copy one another. And, and Robert was so kind to let us sort of uh, emulate his microtransit service when we uh, deployed Pacifica. So I do see a hand raise. Should I, Ben or Ryan, should we take questions? Um, Victoria, do you feel comfortable asking your question at the end, or is this uh, something pertinent for right now? It's a hard question, Ben, but uh, I guess keep with the flow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if you can just hold it for to the end of Robert's presentation, that would be great. Thanks. Okay. Well, I'll go ahead and jump into my presentation. Thanks for those kind words. Um, Share my screen. Okay, so um, good afternoon. My name is Robert Betts. I'm the Director of Planning and Operations at Marin Transit. And I was asked to join today's call to talk a little bit about uh, actual experience implementing transit services to uh, county parks, state parks, and national park lands. Uh, I have to admit some of this was very intentional work by the district and other was accidental um, because we are very fortunate here in Marin County to have a number of uh, different opportunities for uh, parks and open space. I'm gonna assume most people on the call are familiar with the Bay Area, but if not, uh, Marin Transit is the local transit provider here in Marin County. We work very closely with our regional partners uh, Golden Gate Bridge Highway and Transportation District and SMART, uh, Sonoma Marin Area Rail Transit uh, to serve local transit needs here in the county. Uh, this map here shows uh, many of the county's open space, county parks, state parks, uh, water district lands. As, as you can see, there, there are plenty of opportunities here in Marin County. I've heard statistics as high as 80% of our county is designated open space or agricultural preserves. Um, but we are in a lot of ways kind of the playground for uh, much of the Bay Area, at least the, the North Bay. Uh, similar to Christie's slide, this, this is a slide that shows uh, what we provide here in Marin County. Uh, we are, again, the local transit provider, which includes our local bus service. We have a community shuttle program. Uh, the two programs I'm going to focus on in, in this uh, presentation is what we call uh, the Rural Stagecoach Program. These are our, our daily uh, fixed route options out to our more rural areas, as well as our partnership with the National Park Service with the Muir Wood Shuttle. Uh, in addition, we do a lot to support our local uh, schools, uh, our on-demand or our microtransit project, Connect. Uh, and then our local paratransit and other mobility management programs that we offer for older adults uh, and those with disabilities here in Marin. This slide is a quick summary. Uh, this is actually a table I pulled from one of our uh, uh, web pages that encourages our riders to use our transit services to access many of the park lands and open space areas here in Marin County. 
Uh, as you can see, there, there are a number of, of opportunities here. The, uh, the ones that I've highlighted in kind of that orangish brown color, those are all served by our rural stagecoach program. And again, that, that's going to be uh, the focus of, of most of my uh, presentation today. I do want to point out that, that we provide these services largely in partnership um, with the National Park Service, GGNRA, and the Marin County Parks Department. Uh, they've been great partners of ours. We, we coordinate on, on planning, marketing, uh, and in some cases, funding these services uh, to provide the access. I'm gonna talk in detail about our two uh, rural stagecoach programs. Uh, the first is what we call Route 61 or our South Route. And this is a daily public transit service that starts in the urbanized areas of Southern Marin in Sausalito. Uh, it's actually anchored at our Sausalito Ferry Terminal. Uh, it provides local service through what, again, what I'll call the urbanized area through Sausalito, Marin City. It goes into uh, Mill Valley. And then after it leaves that urbanized area, it serves uh, our rural communities in West Marin, uh, which includes Stinson Beach and, and Bolinas. But as you can see on, on along that route, there are many opportunities to access uh, specifically Mount Tam State Park, uh, Stinson Beach, um, and uh, Muir Woods. And one way, you know, there, there's a couple of unique aspects of, of this service. Um, one, one unique quality of, of this route, uh, once we leave the urbanized area, we operate what we call a flag stop service, which means that riders can request uh, the driver to, to stop uh, at, at non-designated stops as well as, as, as long as there's a safe pullout. So this kind of encourages uh, the access um, of the service because oftentimes in the rural lands, uh, it's challenging to designate and formalize a stop location um, that, that we can put on, on a map and a time point. So um, we've operated these routes uh, using the flag stop service for a number of years, and uh, our drivers and our riders have, have become accustomed to those over the years. Uh, another thing that's unique, and, and you can see it here on, on this slide, uh, we actually show trailheads on our south route map, which isn't a feature we often include in our in our schedules. Uh, but but we recognize that so many of our riders in the uh, rural areas take our our services to access those trailheads, and oftentimes they they not only will access a trailhead, but 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 they'll get on and off at one stop, take a trail, and get back on or off at a different stop. So showing how the trail network connects to the transit route is one feature that excuse me, we've included on, on uh, the South Route map. The other route that uh, serves our rural area is what we call the North Route or Route 68. And again, this route is anchored in the urbanized area in downtown San Rafael at our uh, San Rafael Transit Center, which is kind of the hub for transit service here in Marin. Uh, it's served by the Golden Gate Regional Services, by the Smart Services, uh, and really provides that connection point within the urbanized area to access the rural areas. Uh, this route uh, goes out to serve Point Reyes National Seashore and along the way uh, serves Samuel P. Taylor as well as Tamales Bay State Park. You can also see, again, this, it's a little hard on, on this graphic, but that double line there are the areas that we operate flag stop service all the way outside the urbanized area. Our, our, what I'll call our intentional partnership to serve the parks is what we call our Mirwood Shuttle. And uh, I believe we're entering our 12th year now of providing service in partnership with the National Park Service. Uh, and this is a, um, a service that's really grown over the years. And I'm not going to talk through all the different iterations, but what I'm showing on the slide here is our current route structure for Muir Woods. Uh, we currently offer two different pickup locations. Uh, the first is the Sausalito Ferry Terminal that we encourage riders who are not driving to the park to use. The reason we do that is because that stop is, is well served by both ferry and regional bus service out of San Francisco. Uh, the other opportunity we have to connect to Muir Woods is a little ways further to the north, and that's the Larkspur ter Ferry Terminal. Uh, and uh, that's a location that does have um, a large parking area, 
but it's also served by the Larkspur Ferry Service as well as uh, the Smart Rail Service at the Larkspur Station. Um, both of these routes have one single pickup point. Um, once it, it, uh, it serves those locations, it does operate direct out to Muir Woods. And on the park side, we have dedicated parking and loading areas for the national parks. A couple uh, quick statistics statistics on the service. Again, it started in 2009. It was a federal demonstration project. I believe at the time we started with three buses operating every hour or so. Uh, we're now running uh, upwards of 11 or 12 buses um, every 10 to 15 minutes on the service. Um, this service is delivered. We, we do have an MOU uh, agreement with National Park Service. And in addition to specifying uh, service levels, it also specifies a 50-50 financial split. So we, we split the cost of the service 50-50 um, uh, with, with the park service. Um, on our busiest of busy days, we're doing over 3,000 trips on transit to and from the National Monument. Uh, and that equates to uh, approximately 25% of all visitors uh, going to that location. And then the chart at the bottom shows kind of the growth of the program over time. Uh, obviously, we, we, we had a bit of a, a slump there starting in 19, 20, and 21 uh, due, due to the pandemic. And, and we actually suspended service for a year and a half. Um, but the 2022 number shows some of that, that rebounding growth um, over the last six months or so. A couple of other partnership opportunities. This was done in partnership with state parks, county parks, and national parks. We uh, had a very focused effort um, uh, to, to get some of our uh, students in our communities of concern access to the parks. So these are typically our uh, lower income areas within Marin County. We partnered with two different schools to provide free transit service um, to access our, our park lands. And as part of that, they, they took, um, I think it was two or three different field trips to different parks and the students drew pictures about their experience using transit and we used it. Um, we actually took these pictures and posted them on the interiors of our buses uh, as a way to, to continue encouragement um, for, for getting out and seeing some of uh, Marin's park lands uh, using our, our local bus service. Uh, another resource we have available on our website, it's at marintransit.org forward slash transit to parks, is that, uh, that uh, lookup table. There's an interactive map, uh, which just gives our, our users a little bit more pointed information on, on which parks we serve and the routes that serve those parks. Uh, another great partnership opportunity I would encourage you all to do is to show the transit stops on your trail maps. Uh, I believe this is from the one TAM uh, map here in Marin County, and I just uh, did a quick screenshot to show uh, how they <clears throat> feature our transit stops so you can actually plan your trip and see where you can get on and off the bus services. So a, a couple opportunities I've identified, you know, I think one, one valuable resource that transit agencies have or experience with transit. <laughs> and oftentimes our park staff don't necessarily have expertise uh, in these areas. Uh, we, Marin Transit's unique. We are a contract operator, which means that um, we contract with other entities through procurement to actually provide our own local services. And we've been able to pass along uh, a lot of these uh, um, expertise to, to our partners as they're looking at creating shuttle programs and, and going out to bid to, to actually hire similar contractors. Um, I also feel like those public transit uh, investments uh, can also be leveraged for, for uh, those accessing the, the parklands. So investments we've made in terms of vehicle tracking and integration into the Google system and the transit app and Clipper Fare integration, all of these investments now, rather than, than um, others trying to recreate these for their own show programs are available through our public transit offering. Um, in, in some ways, uh, there, there are complementary demand profiles to those that want to go to the parklands and the other public transit services we offer. I think one good example of this is on our Muir Woods shuttle program. Our, our peak visitation on Muir Woods tends to be weekends, holidays, and summers. 
And <clears throat> those are the exact times that, that we don't have schools in session. So we actually use a select subset of our driver pool to drive schools Monday through Friday and you know the 10 months a year when schools are in session. And then those drivers shift over and they actually provide our Mirwood shuttle services uh, on the weekends, holidays, and, and during the summer so we can maintain uh, a nice full, full-time shift um, profile for those drivers. Uh, the ability to leverage funding, different types of funding, we can bring in and, and access federal FTA dollars to help uh, with equipment purchases, and oftentimes there are grants or other funding sources that the Parks Service can provide. Uh, and then the opportunity to co-market, whether that's on print materials or through social media uh, is really important. My final slide is just talking about some of the challenges. Uh, first off, parks tend to be in rural settings and oftentimes transit is challenging to provide in rural settings due to lower densities, longer travel distances and times. Uh, the terrain has become a challenge for us. We have not yet been able to deploy our electric vehicles on routes like the Mirwood shuttle and some of our uh, other routes that, that um, go into the rural areas that have long distances. Um, and as mentioned previously, poor cell coverage, um, whether that's uh, supporting an, uh, uh, an app-based service or whether that's simply trying to track the vehicle that you're looking uh, to get on as a rider. <clears throat> there are also challenges uh, trying to fit public transit into the goals that, that, some, that the parks oftentimes look for. So um, uh, uh, equipment uh, is one. So as a transit operator, we have to provide fully accessible equipment. We have to meet the ADA um, transit operations and, and, and most of the vehicles we purchase anymore are low floor vehicles, which tend to have minimal ground clearance, which oftentimes don't work well in the rural areas. Um, some of our fare policies don't, don't oftentimes uh, align with um, the goals of uh, our, our parks department, whether they want to provide it for free or whether they want to have a fare policy that's different from our local base fare. Um, and, then, and then policies around ADA, and, and this gets a little bit into the weeds, but in terms of op offering complementary paratransit services, uh, for those who are unable to use the fixed route network, that becomes extremely challenging in rural areas. Um, accommodating bikes, other recreational equipment. We, we, we don't have surfboard racks. We've been <laughs> requested to put different types of accommodating uh, racks on our vehicles. Um, all of our vehicles can accommodate up to three bikes, but oftentimes even three bikes uh, does not satisfy the demand of our riders. Um, and then I will also end by saying these services, especially, you know, that partnership with the National Park Service on the Muir Wood service, they're very time and, and resource intensive. Um, as a common example, you know, transit agencies typically change service four, five, maybe six times a year. Muir Woods, because they change their, their hours of operation um, and, and because of the peaky nature of the service, we have about 22 different times we change service. And every time we change service, that's a new driver shift, a new schedule, new marketing materials. Um, so, you know, internally, we often say that we, we allocate about 20% of our staff time to a program that, that's really about 5% of our total ridership. Um, and with that, I will maybe turn it back to Ryan or answer any questions. Thanks, Robert, uh, and thanks to all our speakers. Um, we really appreciate those. It. It it's a lot to cover, like I kind of started off. I'm going to take about 30 seconds, and then I really want to get over to um, Q&A, because I think that's going to be the most important here in the last bit of time. But just at a high level, um, you know, we've got some slides here, we'll, or we're going to share this slide deck so people have access to it. And I compiled kind of takeaways from the, each, each of the presentations. Uh, I'll just kind of quickly go over these. I thought, you know, I think the way this was put together with um, Tina sharing, you know, they're just kind of entering this pilot phase and sort of learning and trying to understand, you know, what they're able to do. So very early in the process. Uh, and then Christy, of course, shared, um, and I'm not going to go just in the interest of time, not going to go through all the takeaways. You guys go get those on the slides. Um, and then with Christy, you know, Christy kind of gave an update on some, you know, they're a little further along in terms of redesigning their, their transportation network and um, starting to think about beaches. 
I'd love to ask a couple of questions to Chris, Christie's more specifically about park access for their new network, but I'll hold off on us for a second there. Um, and then, of course, Robert, at the end, you know, with Marin Transit having a lot of experience with this, having deployed uh, a transportation um, opportunities and transit options for riders to parks explicitly uh, for a number of years and um, the experiences he's had in terms of the challenges and opportunities and pros and cons. So I thought it was a nice flow and sort of between the, you know, what, what Tina and then Christy and then Robert shared. I'm going to um, stop talking and really just open it up to questions. Um, I know that there was a few hands raised, so I'm going to pause uh, my screen and just actually I'll just stop my screen here and let in case there's um, folks need to show slides. Um, so one of the questions uh, was for Christy and Robert uh, to talk a little bit more about the cost. This is from Diana from the Napa Valley Transportation Authority. And Diana, if you want to get off mute and just ask that, um, feel free to you know, elaborate on the question. Hi, yeah, thank you. Um, great presentation from everybody today. And um, I'm excited to go and check out some of these uh, Marin routes that I didn't know existed. Um, we're a transit operator up here, and um, we certainly understand and are aware of the challenges especially now, and Christy, I think you mentioned a few of those issues given, you know, uh, shortages with drivers and things like that. And, and Robert touched a little bit on the ADA component. Um, can you just talk a little bit more about the cost, like the fare for, um, I guess this is probably more directed to Robert um, and the, the stagecoach route. Um, does that, that's not just to, to take folks who, live out in the rural zones to parks, but also covers just transit for those folks who live out in the rural areas and just kind of what the, what's the cost for the ride? Um, what kind of, what's your funding source that you're using to cover it? Yeah, yeah, gr uh, great question. And as I started my presentation, like I said, some of, some of what we do is intentional, that's the Mirror Wood Shuttle. The unintentional is uh, the stagecoach service. And, and those routes were really established to serve our local residents in West Marin. And, and what we saw after we established those routes, you know, we, we originally favored schedules that, you know, were more commute based, Monday through Friday, trying to get folks into the urbanized area for work purposes. And what we found out is we had stronger demands coming in on the weekends. We actually run twice as much service on the weekends on the South route than we do on the weekdays because we had uh, really strong demands to get to some of these recreational areas. So um, the, the rural stagecoach, it, it functions just like our local transit network. It's the same fare structure. So you, it's $2 for adults, $1 for seniors and youth. You can go from San Rafael to, to Point Reyes with that fare. Um, it's, it's funded through, you know, our traditional funding sources. We, we do, I believe, uh, use 5310 rural funds um, because it is a rural area uh, here in the Bay Area. Um, and um, I, I should also mention we are we are, we are blessed in Marin County with our local measure AA. We do receive a lot of local funding, um, and that's one reason we're able to be so active with with the national parks on the Mirwood Shuttle service because um, because of that local funding. So. Excellent. I, Thank you. I'll just say we, we have Measure W here as well. So we have a healthy local sales tax, um, uh, but we do have a little bit of a different operation. Um, we don't have the contracted service that Robert, that the Marin system operates. So um, a little bit of a, just a little different difference there. All right. Thank you, Diana, for the question and the responses. Victoria, you have your hand up. We'd love to hear your question. Feel free to put, take yourself off mute. Yes, Mike. Question is for Christy. I was wondering if she could share some of the methods they had used for co-defining success for these different pilots and how they both created and supported the buy-in with uh, potential users of these services, especially if they like the service, even if it's then deemed not successful and uh, would be canceled. Great, thank you for that question, Victoria. Um, so I think I think you're referring to our pilot that we operated in Pacifica, the microtransit pilot. Um, and so what we really wanted to understand um, was did that service uh, provide a better customer experience for our riders 
and did it reduce the costs for us and grow ridership? Um, and so what we did in this in this situation was we took the we had a deviated fixed route shuttle, so it was a smaller vehicle operating in a loop. Uh, once an hour, it could go off route up to a half mile, but you had to call a day in advance and it could only deviate once per trip. So it was really clunky. It's like an early generation flexible service and the ridership, no one used the deviation and the, the schedule had a lot of time built in. So it was just really inefficient. So we just thought it was ripe for doing something different. Um, and that's so our metrics weren't really you know, must reach six passengers an hour. It was kind of a little bit more loosely defined, but at the end of it, we saw that we actually had less ridership. Some people liked the service, the flexibility of it, but we learned that unless we had more resources to add to it, it was really gonna degrade the customer experience uh, because you can only, the algorithm supports only so, it only allows the shuttle to do so much when so many trip requests are coming in. So, I mean, I could spend an hour talking about microtransit challenges, but, um, and so, uh, you know, we shut it down. We brought the Flex Pacifica back and actually now we're changing it to a, a normal fixed route through our reimagined service. So, but we didn't, you know, it was important for us to engage with the community, to be transparent, to do a lot of outreach up front. Um, which is what we've done for Reimagine as well to try to get that buy-in. Um, and what we're not doing with Reimagine is replacing a fixed route with a flexible service. We are augmenting our fixed route network and layering it on uh, as a complement. And I think that will be uh, that'll be a huge difference uh, in this new service. I hope that answers your question. Got a thumbs up, Christy. All right, um, we have a couple more minutes for questions. And uh, so if anyone has another question, feel free to jump in right now. And if, if, um, if we need an extra minute or two, we can ask the presenters if they're willing to stick on for another couple minutes. Um, while we're waiting, I just had a really quick one, um, both for Christy and Robert, do, does the stagecoach and then also the microtransit you're uh, working towards, Christy, do they uh, accept Clipper? <laughs> uh, Robert, you want this to escape stagecoach except Clipper? I'm sure it does, right? Yeah. Stagecoach does. I will say Mirwood Shuttle does not. Oh, I should talk to you about that offline. Um, so the, we want it to accept Clipper, um, but I think I'm going to pitch that it runs free. Quite frankly, I'm done with collecting fares <laughs> in transit. It is exhausting. And um, I think uh, so that's how that's what I'm going to pitch. Um, so I got to work through that. But uh, it is designed to uh, emulate our normal fare system. So we would accept all Sam Trans fare media, but I mm -hmm. want it to go free. So we'll see if I can make that happen. <laughs> we'll see a lot of applause. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I need some letters one, of support. <laughs> one way to reduce uh, barriers to transportation is make it free. Um, and, and while we're waiting for any last questions, I'll just share experience I had. I, right before the pandemic, my wife and I went to London and used the, the underground there. And I was just blown away. I didn't have to buy anything or do anything. I literally just took my phone and swiped it. And it made using transportation like just insanely easy. Um, so just a, a, something I, I, I'm sure that those of you in the transit world are familiar with the ins and outs of payments and apps and Clipper and so on and so forth, but I was pretty impressed with that. Um, any other thoughts? We're right on the two o'clock mark. Um, certainly a good crowd out there. Any last thoughts or questions or comments? I feel like we could talk. I know I could talk about this all day. I love this stuff. Um, well, if anyone has any last, feel free to unmute yourself and chime in. Um, but with that, I'll just take the last minute here to uh, thank Ben uh, for doing the introduction and our speakers. Um, thank you guys so much for coming and putting the time in. There's, you know, it takes time to put these slides together and meetings ahead of time. So I appreciate you all's time and, and all of you for uh, joining this afternoon. Um, this is being recorded and I, I'm sure Ben, if you want to hop in for a second and mention anything else, but I think you'll share out the slide deck and um, information for the participants. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. And thank you, Christy, Robert, and Tina, our speakers for the day. Um, yeah, so happy to have you. This was a really uh, educational experience for me and I'm sure others. Um, and we will get a link out there to everybody with the recording and the slide deck soon um, for everyone on the Batsy Google group. Uh, that means you. And for anyone who is not on the Batsy Google group, uh, just shoot me an email and I will be sure to get it to you uh, personally, but yeah.
thank you all for joining and uh, we'll see you next week at the quarterly Batsy meeting. Have a great day, y'all.